James the Bow on the Scoville and dedicate to regional peoples and, you know, blessings. We got our people from the motherland out in South Africa, you know, Tata. How you doing, my brother? Mm, it's a pleasure getting up. We're going to speak on some great things about African spirituality, Bantu peoples, and the connection to A.G. Kemet, you know, because a lot of people can't make the connection with West Africa and ancient Kemet, you know. So if you tell us a little bit about it, tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Uh, well, my name is Tau Tau Haramanuba. Uh, I was born in South Africa 48 years ago. Uh, my father was a bishop. He married uh, 14 wives and he had 52 children. I'm one of his 52 children. Wow. He had his own church. I come from a very long line of polygamists. My, my father had his wives. So is my grandfather and so Zodi. And great grandfather Mahmoud Zieja and great grandfather uh, Mahutu, and then who is the son of Mutata and who is the son of Sinyenye, which is what we call Sinyenye Sara, Hwales Shoman, is part of our eponym, mm. our praise poem. So I'm the seventh generation from the very founder of our lineage. Uh, this Elders were traditional healers. They were rainmakers. They were also running an initiation school, a traditional initiation school that is uh, designed to transform boys into men. Right. Uh, which is yeah, uh, in indigenous Bantu societies. Right. So we are part of the northern sutu babedi which is what is called the northern sutu the sutu of the north no southern sutu is lesotho in the free state and so forth so we're part of the northern sutu um my mother's people are part of the uh, the mujaji people which is the rain queen the only rain queen of southern africa or the only rain queen in south in africa uh, she's found in our province they originally come from the Monomotapa Kingdom of Zimbabwe uh, in the 18th century. Okay. Uh, the first was Queen Zugundini, who left the Monomotapa Kingdom and come across the Limpopo River into South Africa, which wow. they, they call it Ningizim, or Place of Many Gods. Wow. That is our indigenous name for South Africa is Ningizim. Uh, among the Muni people, that is the Zulu, the Kosa, the Swati, then the uh, uh, they refer to this part as in, in Ingizi, or place of many gods. So, my mother's people, they are from the Balobedu, which is the Rain Queen's people, and my father's people are from the Northern Sutu, or Babedi, which are the people of King Sikukuni, Sikuati, and Mampuru. Um, like I said, I'm the seventh generation. Uh, child number 27 of my father's 52 children. Wow. Uh, Plenty of brothers and sisters. Wow. I have a whole lot of brothers and sisters. So my mother was more like a, a wife number seven. Wow. So I'm a strict product of polygamy. Anybody who has a polygamy, a problem with polygamy has a problem with me. Yeah. I don't join I all this monotheistic and monogamous groups of Rastafari, Naya, Bingi, Bobo, Shandi, 12 tribe, I don't subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to anything that preaches monogamy because you are effectively saying those of us who are born out of polygamous relationship, we are either illegitimate children or born out of sin and all of these things. So, you know, I don't beat myself on a street fight. I don't do those. So things. are you, are you Rasta? Are you Rasta? I'm a Rasta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rasta. Yeah, I which through... which sect? Because you know you have Naya Bingi, Babishanti, different ones. Yeah. Well, let me tell you my evolution of Rastafara. I became Rasta 33 years ago. And then I was about 16 years old. I was a young freedom fighter being prepared to go for a military training to go and fight against apartheid. So our commander 
introduced to me Rastafara in a very indirect way. He was a man who, he was not a Rasta, he's not a Rasta, but then he was exposing us to many things, many information, you know, the other day we'll sit with him, he will play a video of Nicaragua and the Sandinista revolutionary movement. He will play about the Bavenda revolutionaries like Racha Harachitanga. He will show us uh, the Cuban revolution, Fidel Castro. He will show us the Chinese revolution, Mao Zedong. And then one day he then played Bob Mali. Uh, that was during the days of the VHS videos. Um, that was in 1990, to be precise. From now, that was in 33 years ago. And then he played Legend. And then when it comes to Redemption Song, he rewinded it three times. And the part where Bob Marley said, none but ourselves can free our mind really got hold of me. It got my attention, it touched me. And the third time when he rewinded that song, and it keep on repeating, none but ourselves can free our mind. Uh, I then made my decision that I am going to be, I'm a Rastaman. I identify with Rastafara and I'm going to be a Rastaman. I started to grow my first dreadlocks. I left, I went and looked for one of my father's sons from the first wife. He used to have a collection of the LPs during yeah. the days of the LPs and the Space Gram. Yeah, I remember. So, yeah, then he, I went there to check him. He used to have a whole lot of them, but the, I found he was only left with legend and uprising from Bob Mali and Mama Africa from Peter Tosh. He gave me those three LPs. And then I went ahead to um, to listen to them. I kept on listening to them. So there was one old Rast uh, elderly Rasta man in my place. We call him Ras Sol. He was a member of Azapo, which is Azanian People's Organization, one of the three major liberation movements that fought apartheid, which is the ANC, the PAC, and Azapo. The Azapo is actually the product of Steve Biko's Black Consciousness Movement. Yes. So... Rastaman was part of this black consciousness circle, was a member of Azapo. So I went to him, and then the first uh, information about Rastafara he exposed to me <clears throat> was a chapter coming from Timothy, Timothy White um, biography of Bob Marley called Catch a Fire. Now, if you read Timothy White uh, Catch a Fire, there is a part there which is called Kingdom Come. Mm -hmm. Now, that chapter then, it is dealing with the life of Haile Selassie, you know, from he was a child. Um, he could read what is written in the central passages of the Kabbalah, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the ancient mysticism, the Mizusa, the Hebrew mysticism. He could tell what is written in the Ark of the Covenant without having seen it. So there was, there's a lot mystical it is said about Haile Selassie. Yeah. Uh, you know that Rastafari is Haile Selassie's name and Rastafari, a central to Rastafari is Haile Selassie. Um, or Rastafari, as I said, is Haile Selassie's name. So we are people called by Haile Selassie's name. We are people who call upon Haile Selassie's name. We are people who say Rastafari is our liberty, Rastafari is our consciousness, Rastafari is our world view. We are Rastafari, we are not Rastafarians, and we don't practice a thing called Rastafarianism. So now, as a Rasta man, I grew up from that. I, I, I was introduced to Rastafari through reggae, through Bob Mali, and my first understanding of Rastafari was, was that it is a liberation movement. I met Rastafari in the course of uh, the struggle against apartheid and being part of the liberation movement against apartheid in South Africa. Right. So... For me, my first grounding of Rastafara was is a liberation movement, um, is fighting for mental liberation to break free the mental chains. And then, then I came through reggae and reading Rastafara material stuff. But the first organized group of Rastafara I became part of was the 12th tribe of Israel. Now, in South Africa, we have the 12 tribe of Israel. It's different from the 12 tribe of Israel that is found in England, America, and Jamaica, uh, founded by the prophet God. Okay. Uh, the 12 tribe of Israel is very biblical. You know, it's the people who keep the Sabbath, who observe the Old Testament festivals, uh, the Feast of the Tabernacle, the New Moon, um, 
very, very, it is the most idle. You know, like the Twelve Tribe out there. Yeah, they are very the most out there. Well, the is the most but I've seen a lot of the ones in the United States, and they have the Twelve Tribes, and they don't include they don't include Africans. They seem to only include the Caribbean, part of South America, North America. Mm-hmm. So, like you're saying, you're correcting how the charts are. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so we there is a, a, a South African evolved trial tribe, yeah. which is biblically Old Testament, particularly Old Testament influenced, but also having great element of African tradition. So now, I came to try to study when we when we speak on African tradition, and if you continue, where 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 the Bantu come into this. What's your earliest knowledge of the Bantu? Because a lot of the, the Zulu, the Shape, the, um, all the different peoples of Bantu right across sub-Saharan Africa. Do you find this one different, a mixture of spiritual systems, or do you find them very similar, Bantus? Well, we, we are Bantu. Yeah, yeah. I'm, my route is Nigeria, from my father's side, Bantus. All, yeah. the black, all the black ethnic group in South Africa are Bantu. Yeah. Hulu, Tosa, Swati, Ndebele, Pedi, Tswana, Venda, Tsonga, um, Sutu. This is a Bantu, South African Bantu. And everybody in Zimbabwe is Bantu. Shona, yeah. Ndebele, everybody in Zambia is Bantu. Um, 98% of people in Namibia is Bantu. Everybody in Angola is Bantu. Everybody in the Congo is Bantu. The Hutu and the Tutsi in Rwanda are Bantu people. Uh, the same in Tanzania, probably 99% is Bantu, again, exception of the Maasai, who will say they are Nilots. Yeah, yeah. Which is notable because Nilot is simply mean the people who live by the, by the Nile River. But uh, by the Nile River, you get also the Bantu, the Baganda, the Banyoro, the ba- uh, um, the 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 the, the Bachwezi, all those groups are Bantu. Bantu is actually all these people who prefix themselves with the prefix Ba, Ba Congo, Ba Nyarwanda, Ba Ganda, Ba Tutu, Ba Tswana, Ba Venda is the Ba. Now the Ba essence, which you find it from here all the way to Kimet, it means the same thing. Yeah. Which is the soul, right? Uh, yeah, it, and then in two, it is this cosmic force, right? That it is the totality of everything. You know, it it, it there's an element of it which basically is God. There's an element of undo, which is the sound we make when we walk. The sound we say that's why I say moon to the one who say when they walk. Yeah, the sound we make when we speak. When they want you to speak, they say tu la, close the two, close the do. So there's a variation to it, it is in do, tu, tu, like wadu, bandu, vanu. So in other Neta, countries, Neta Yeah, but um, it is a linguistic cultural community. So the bandu is all these people who use three stones when they make fire. So right. if you travel through what when you come across people who use three stones when they make fires, the Bantu. But the three stones are symbol of the ancient Bantu trinity, which is the trinity of Mudimu Badimu Bodu, meaning God, ancestors, and Ubuntu, which is the Bantu philosophy, Ubuntu, which is similar to what they call Ma'at in Kemet. Okay. It's the principle of order, it's a principle of harmony, it's a principle of uh, balance personal, personal relations the principle of menarism yeah and the principle of rituals this principle of coexistence so it is the humanization of the human that without ubuntu a human being is like a subhuman it's like an animal so what separates humans from animals is ubuntu this philosophy of existence um and this philosophy of life so, so, so everything we do is is tied up to our bandwidth. Even within Rastafara, what we usually are said is that bandwidth is who we are. 
Rastafari is what we are. So Rastafari is what is a what? And hence the source of debate. You will get people who try to tell you that uh, you're not Naya Bingi enough. You're not 12 tribe enough. Uh, Bobo Shandi enough. But you can never tell me that I'm not a Bandu enough. Yeah. So Bandu is not a matter of debate. Can I just ask a only... question? And you know, because we look at different people's philosophy, we see the sciences. Now, the science seems to have tried to take over their thing. Now, what they tried to say is the only people in West Africa that are connected to ancient Kemet, well, Egypt, they call it, would be um, the Falani and the Hausa, where they, they don't actually speak of any Bantu people having connections to ancient Kemet, the scientists. You know, the now and again, they might have something about linguistic ties and stuff. With uh, Uganda, what's up? What do you think of the well, scientists on these kind of things? Well, you see, um, it is always important. They say uh, tales of the hunter always glorify the hunter. Tales of the lion always glorify the hunter. That's right. Now, with any people and their story and their history, you need to first get it from them first. Yeah. Now. That's right before you get it from other secondary sources, whether they come under the pretext of being scientists. Scientists are not God. Yeah. And um, scientific findings are not omnipotent, you know, are not beyond reproach. Uh, they've made a whole lot of uh, mistake. Yeah. Actually, they've shifted the human origin to many places uh, yeah. around the world. And we have, they say we have a common ancestor with apes. I don't believe, I can't believe anything like that. You know? It's not part of the African yeah. cosmological science. That's Our right. science yeah. by human beings with animals. Animals belong to the animal kingdom, human beings to the human kingdom, minerals yeah. to the mineral kingdom, and vegetation to the vegetation kingdom. We don't mix. That's so, right. So my point with this is um, the ancient... Let's let's look at the ancient Kemites. Okay. They are self definition. Now the ancient Kemites, they say we come from the beginning of the Nile. We come from the foot hills of the mountains of the moon. Yeah. We come from where goddess happy dwells. Now the beginning of the Nile is in the heart of the Congo. The beginning of the Nile is a river called Lualaba. It's found in the Congo, coming through Rwanda, um, going through Uganda. Now, if the Kemites, they say they come from the beginning of the Nile, what does it say about them? That they are Bantu. Definitely. The, of the Nile is a land of the Bantu. It's in the heartland of the land of the Bantu. Yeah. That is one part. But we also learn that the earliest inhabitants of Kemites, of Kemet, they were referred to as they were the earliest inhabitants of Kemites. They were known as the Anu. Anu. The Anu A N U. Anu is another variation of Bantu. Yeah. Badu, Banu, Batu. So, so the earliest inhabitants of Kemet, Osiris was from the Anu. You understand? According to the history of ancient Kemet, Osiris was one of the Anu. Okay. And one of the centers of uh, the Ra, of the worship of Ra, you'll find it in uh, in the city of Anu, what they call On, or Heliopolis, in mm. Greece, in the center of the worship of Ra. But this idea is, very, is still prevalent among us. Uh, among the Batswana, Basuti, Babedi, which is my people now, um, the prefix and the appellation for a male is Ra. We, we apply the word Ra to a man. Ra means it will mean the Lord of the Water. You know, uh, Ransu, the Lord of Blackness. Yeah. Ra is men, Ma is for women. So, and Ra is a symbol, is a name for the sun. Ra is the name of man. And we, we say, the cosmic symbol for man or the cosmic representation of man is the sun. And the cosmic representation of the woman is the moon. And the cosmic representation of the children is the stars. So we combine the solar mysteries 
and the lunar mysteries and the stellar mysteries. Now, this is found in our, our one of the names we use to refer to the divine is Rama Sedi, which is Ra, the sun, Ma, the moon, Sedi, the stars. So this name that we call the divine, with it means sun, moon, and stars. Okay. Remember, we are, we are cosmologians. We are not theologians. Yeah. We deal with the totality of the cosmos, yeah. the sun, the moon, and the stars. This is what Kimet talk about, what they refer to as the netta. It is the, uh, the, the, the deification of nature. We deify the principles of nature. We deal with nature as divine. So Kimet, what they call the gods of Egypt are not gods <laughs> in a sense of deities. Yeah. They are, they are nature, they are the principles of nature, they are nature deified. Now, this thing you still find it among the language of my people. We'll talk about you say, Oh, James loved to do this and this and this. But then when we do rationalize that, we say, No, it is his nature. Yeah. We don't have a thing. That is his nature. We yeah. don't have a thing with it is his creation. So we look at a human being as a product of nature. The natural origin of man is man. It is his nature. It is in his nature to behave this way. It is in his nature to... Your allergies, if you don't like this, you eat this, you don't eat that, we are going to say it is his nature. Now, now show me if there is no similarity between this and the ancient Kemet. Yeah. When they, they fight into Netas or Neteru, which are netherus of different things. You talk about shoe, is the principles of air. You know? Yeah. Tefna, principle of moist. You know? Horus, the sun. You know, all of this is nature deified. Now, you know, when ancient Kemet, um, you know, because Egypt had a lot of invasions, there was many different people coming from Asia. Uh, Asiatics, the High Sox, Persians. So all these different groups coming in, they change, they change the Egypt and you know the original, the original way how it was, what they believed before the invasions of High Sox and these peoples. It was a different, different worship. When would you say yes. Egypt fell, Kemet fell? At what point? Yes. You see, this is this is why um, myself and those we share the same school of thought of using Bantu to interpret Kemet. Because we recognize that what is referred to as Kemet is highly diluted uh, with what you talk about. 1675 BC, the yeah, first invasion. Yeah. Uh, 1,636, it continues with the same Hicksons. Uh, 600, 666 BC, the Assyrians. They were 500, 525 BC, the Persians. Yeah. 332 BC, the Greeks through Alexander the Great. Yeah. Uh, 30 BC, the Romans. 639 AD, the Arabs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, with Islam, uh, with their first general who came and invaded Kemet in 639 on the 12th of December. Wow. And okay. then subsequently, you had now the French and uh, Napoleon, Count Volney, write about it in the Ruins of Empire. There's a book called Ruins of Empire by Count Volney who bear witness to the shooting of the nose of the Sphinx. He was uh, one yeah. of the end that went with Napoleon to Kemet. Yeah. And who testified that the, the nose of it, everything was so Afrocoid, it was so Negroid as you wish. Yeah. So, and then, then you had the, the, the British went in, which gave access to the likes of Wallace Barge, to get all those full papyri, which they then converted into what today they call the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Yeah. So 
it had it undergone a lot of invention, but the the one invention that really changed the shape of it uh, is by the Hyksos, who ruled for 108 years when they invaded in 1775 BC. They're the they, Semitic they, Semitic peoples, the Hyksos, yes, Semitic. They are Asiatics. Asiatics. Um, the Asiatics, they come from Asia. They are also known as ha ha Haribu or Habiru, which is later known as Hebrew. So what do you study in the Bible as the exodus of the Israelites leaving Kemet? It is actually during the day when the pharaohs of Kemet were kicking out these Asiatic groups, yeah. the Habiru, Hebrew, out of Kemet. Yeah. But now it is said differently in the Bible, but it is actually referring to that particular That's movement right. of getting rid of strangers out of their land. That's it. With with their invention of Kemet, they introduced certain practices that were not part of us, like monotheism. Um like uh circumcision. They come up with all of these type of practices into Kemet. Okay. So yeah, so they left certain practices. The Greeks, the invasion of the Greeks, it changed the names and we get we find ourselves using the names we are using, Osiris, you know, um Horus, Anubis, yeah. Segment. So these are names that were coined by the Greeks because they could not pronounce names like Musasi, which is Isis, Usara which is Osiris, Tau Tau, which mm. is Tehut, or what they call Toth Hermes, or Mechurias. The Arabs, they call him Idris. The Hebrews, they call him Enoch. And the Romans, they call him Mechurias. The Greeks, they call him Toth Hermes, Tris Magastas, Tris the Greatest. So, so, the, so they change the names. And, and this is where we have a contention because we're always saying that uh, if you can't name it, you can't claim it. If, if you come, if you, like you tell me, you Africans, you worship ancestors. And I say, what is ancestor worship in any African language? There's no such thing. Yeah. Pain you homage, say, you know. Yeah. You say, you Africans are polytheist you worship many gods and say what is that in our language yeah what is polytheism in zulu in Kosa? okay in shoda yeah in, in the baganda language we don't have that okay now, if you can name it, you can name it so most of the things that it is said we do we don't have names for that we don't even have a name for sunday i i, I usually ask a lot of people and say what is sunday in your mother tongue because I know that in most languages, in one of the, in, in, in the 14 languages I speak, uh, Sunday, it means, it is a borrowed word. Uh, others, they say Sondag, Sondag, which is basically corruption of Sondag, which is like Dutch going there. Okay. But, but we don't have Sunday because we had a week of six days. We say Monday, Musukuluk, meaning the beginning. I would say Sunday, Saturday, which, is, which means the end. So our name for Monday, it means the beginning. Our name, it's Musupudu. Our name for Saturday, it means the end of the days. And any other thing in between that is just numerical. You know, uh, the, it is Tuesday, which means Labu Bed, which basically means that which follow the first day. Labrar, that which follow the second day. Labu, that which follow the third day. Labu that which follow the fourth day. The end. So basically, they are numericals. So another, another thing. Um, sorry, um, I, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of travel in different times, and that, and um, I found the African linguistics around different places in the world. So places like um, I went into the South Pacific, Fiji Islands, and they clearly tell you we're from Africa. They actually tell you they're from Lake Tanganyika. You know, so see, fifteen hundred BC, they reach Fiji. But they've got it. There's supposed to be a lot of linguistic ties with West African 
either the Mandy, Niger Congo band, but they're all connected, aren't they? So I was wondering yeah. if you aware of anything like that, African linguistics out in Asia to the Pacific? Well, there, there are a lot of linguistic ties that goes all the way to, even to Japan. I mean, Japan, I yeah. usually will be checking a lot of Japanese with this. I'm so Bantu, Matsumoto, yeah. all of these names. There's Definitely. Very, very majority of them. Yeah. But but you see, these things, they, they, are, they are accounted for by signs of homogenetics, homo origin. There is this homo origin of mankind that uh, all females we have on earth today, they all descend from one black woman who lived in Central Africa about 300,000 years ago. Yeah. That is now proven through the framework of mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA. That was uh, interesting. Then, Central Africa. Then, hmm? Central Africa. They used to say Central Ethiopia. Af- yeah, they used to say Ethiopia, didn't they? No, that's, that's a biblical concept, man. You right. Know, our, our, according to our own cosmologies, or our own mythologies, which is also supported by um, anthropology. The, our origin is in the center of Africa, the womb of Africa, the navel of the earth. We come from Central Africa and then we fan into different directions of this continent. North Africa, East Africa, West Africa. We went to Ethiopia from Central Africa. We did not come from Ethiopia and come to Central Africa. Now, yeah. they used to have a, uh, I think, in the 50s or 60s, Johansson, <laughs> they found a bone dating back to 3.2 million years ago in Ethiopia. Yeah. You see, they call that. They named this fossil, they named it Lucy. Yeah. yeah. With the Ethiopians, they named it um Dinklesh, which means thou are wonderful. Okay. But wait a minute. In 2002, on the 10th of July, the ABC News in England um uh broadcasted the uh, the oldest finding they have of human being like our 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 genotype, our phenotype, our what modern humans, what they call modern human. Yeah. They found to be dating, they found in, in, in around Lake Chad in Central Africa, they found a fossil that date back to seven million years ago. Seven million there, wow. There, there hasn't been any fossil discovered yeah. that back to seven million years ago. Yeah. So the the story of our ancestors that they come from Central Africa. Our thesis of the Central African origin of the Africans, the Great Lakes regions, the tropics, coming through the Batwa, whom the Egyptian deified as Bes. This is the god called Bes, the oldest god of ancient Kemet is a Motwa. Or what they call the pygmies. Uh, yeah, the small. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the small people. There yeah, is yeah. actually a book written by an Englishman called Albert Churchward called Signs and Symbols of Primordial Men. And uh, in those signs and symbols, he document all the signs and symbols that were collected. That the very first namers of things who gave names to things and made symbols even the swastika that Hitler used was taken from these people the Batwa or yeah. the Pygmy of and in, in, Africa and that before they, it was in India as well before because it's in the reverse isn't it the swastika yes, Gravidians and so forth but now Gravidians. that is now yes well, I'm taking you through 
Central Africa among the Batwa we are mm. talking about now approximating that seven million years date. Yeah, because wow. this is the inhabitant of Africa, the pygmies, the Batwa. See, funny enough, you said that is. I've always believed the pygmies are the oldest population in Africa, but you get some people who like to believe the San Bushmen. They want to be believe the Khoisan that and the, and they say the Khoisan went into Asia and made up. I don't. I could never believe that the Khoisan by themselves could have made up the populations of all mankind around the planet. You know, the Khoisan and the Batwa and the Pygmies are the same group of people. Okay, they, they broke off. Yeah. Yeah, they broke off. Like when they go to Southern Africa, they get to be known as the Koi and the San, the Hoten Toads, and all of that. <clears throat> okay. The Bushmen. But they're the same group of people. <clears throat> yeah. Same types, phenotypes, all of that. So in Southern Africa, they are called the Koi San, yeah. which is now a new identity that. The racial, the racially mixed South Africans, we used to refer to them as the colored, or during apartheid they were referred to as the colored during yeah. the group area of apartheid. <clears throat> yeah, the gym, <clears throat> we were grouped into four groups, you know, the whites, the blacks, the Indians, and the colors, which is basically the racially mixed. Yeah. So during apartheid, they were happy to be called colors and getting the privileges that they were given, which were about black people. Black people were in the bottom of the leather, of the leather. Right, yeah. So it was white people, Indians, colors. Even in 1983, they established a tricameral parliament where the apartheid parliament began to accommodate the colors and the Indians and continue to exclude black people until 1994 when Mandela became president. Okay. Now... They enjoy the privileges of being a colored. You had yep. a lot of black you had a lot of black people who also changed their surname into the colored surname. If you are Mutim Kulu, you will call yourself Kruot Bom, which means great tree. Right. And then if you are um Ndlov, you'll call yourself Oliphant. You get those surnames, they're still all around. People just literally change their African say name to the equivalent of it in Africans in Dutch. Mm -hmm. Dutch and yeah, then, yeah. And then from they change their classification from being black to colored because you have dark colors, you know, um, who speak Africans, dark like myself, you know, but yeah. the beginning of the African languages except Africans and who carry the whole colored culture and mannerism and the way of speaking and way of doing things. So so therefore they did that and then they get de and reclassified as colored, enjoy the privileges of being a colored and all of that. Now after 1994, that identity doesn't help anymore. They change now they claim to be a Khoisan. Right. You hardly get all of a sudden colors they say they are Khoisan. But we still okay. have Khoisan. We still have Khoisan who doesn't look anything close to colors. Yeah, yeah. The color, yeah. The Khoisan have a short hair. Yeah. Very, very rough African hair. What do we call Kafra hair? Exactly. You know, like... Peppercorn. peppercorn. Yeah, yeah. You must know um, a lot of people, they talk about ancient Sumer, Mesopotamia. They always try to try to predate African civilizations, but it's pretty obvious Africa influenced them before they influenced us. You see, um, we need to deal with uh, racism in the scholarship space. Yeah. But, uh, in the process, even civilization that just came the other day, uh, they are predated against African civilization. Exactly, yeah. Yet, all the European scholars of the Bantu, whether it's Bleak, Greenberg, Classic temples, Jahayans, yeah. all these people who have studied the band or written anything about the band, all of them, they have one thing in agreement. They don't know when did the whole band to people begin. So it's all speculation. Some they say, 
oh four thousand BC. Yeah, yeah. We were we were somewhere around the Benu River in West Africa. Yeah. And how we become such a largest population. We form 75% of Africa's population. I'm happy you mentioned that. I'm happy you mentioned yeah. that. So they come up with a whole lot of theories as to how did we populate the continent? Yeah. How did we become populous? Yeah. Uh, some places they would even say we colonized or we invaded. We can't colonize our continent. We can't invade our continent. We are not foreigners to Africa. And and, and we don't originate anywhere except in Africa. That's right. And most of our cosmological science, most of our stories of origin, the stories of creation, as you know, that um, we have about 3,000 ethnic groups, or what they call tribes. Yeah. Uh, and these 3,000 ethnic groups, each one of them have a name for God. And that name is indigenous. It was not introduced by outsiders. It did not came with the Arab Muslims or the European Christians. Yeah. It, so the, we had a name for God, where the concept of God, where the God complex. So, and and that is indigenous to us. Yeah. Before. We came across everybody. And in all of our cosmologies, in all of our stories of Genesis, in all our natural Genesis, it talks of our origin in this continent. Some of the stories they talk of us as inner terrestrials. We came from the belly of the earth. The Botswana, Ed Muchudi in Botswana. The Botswana talk of Mudimua Haluwe or the god of Luwe. Now Luwe, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place in Muchu where it's a cave. In this cave, it's got footsteps on the rocks, human and animal footsteps. Now, these footsteps, there is one among all of these footsteps, a very big one. It is attributed to a being called Masieng or Luwe or a god. That uh, this is an evidence that a god led us out of the cave um, into outside, out, out of the belly of the earth with our livestock and everything, you see. So some stories of our creation, and, and we have a lot of those geographical areas. Wherever you get the people, like in the province of Limpopo, we have Makapan start, a Makapan World Heritage Site is a cave also where the people first emerged, when they emerging from the belly of the earth. Some they talk about us emerging from the Great Lakes, like the ancient Kemets. They talk about the waters of Nu, the Heliopolis creation story of Atum, the god who seated on a mound out of the waters, the primordial waters of Nu. Uh, that mound is called the Ben Ben, the Ben Ben Stone, or the first pyramid, where this god Atum sat on it and begin to manifest creation. So we have stories of creation that attribute our origin from the belly of the earth as inner terrestrials. We have stories of origin that attribute our origin from the, the, the great waters that we came through the reeds, like the Zulu, they talk about coming out of the bed of reeds. And most of these stories of creation, they tell you, the source of man and the source of God is the same thing. They don't even tell you that we were created by God. They tell you that we and God come from the same source. Like the Zulu story of creation, they said, God came first came out of the reeds. Human beings came out of the reeds. And they all came with everything that they know today. Those who were iron smith, they already came with the knowledge of waking the iron. 
Uh, those who were wood carvers, they came already with the knowledge of wood carving and sculpturing. So, and then the other stories of creation, they said, like the Zulu, Zulu means heaven. So you say Amazon, you basically say the people of the heavens. So some they say they come from the stars. Um, but all in all, our stories of creation, they talk of our origin from this earth. Yeah. What about the this Dogon? Um, you know the story the Dogon speaking about? But did they speak on, they came from the stars or somebody visited them from the stars, was it? The Dogon of Mali. Yes. I know they talk of the Nomos, uh, the beings of the stars. Yeah. The beings who came from the stars. That's right. The beings that came to visit. Ah, uh, yeah. Teach mm. them the knowledge. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Dogon. Yeah. Oh, the, that those who brought them the knowledge were from the stars. He thought the Dogons, um, they were the first in the world. Yeah. Document Cyrus mm -hmm. A and Cyrus B star. Yeah. The smallest and the most, uh, one of them is, is very invisible star. The white dwarf. Before, yeah. Before the invention of the telescope. Yeah. There is actually a book, The Conversations. Uh, 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 Marcel Grioli, a French anthropologist with a dog on um, a, a, a keeper of knowledge, um, Ogotomeli. Um, with Ogotomeli, they had a conversation almost for a whole month, and then he converted that into a book. He's actually the first one to bring the knowledge of the dog on people. To the west, right. uh, documented knowledge of the Dogons to the west, uh, that there is this group of people who are living by escarpment of Bandiagara, uh, the sages of Bandiagara in Mali. Yeah, um, who this is their clothes, the Bogola, the one I'm wearing here, right? This is their okay. Clothes. This is their, their, uh, their, their, their thing, the Tuareg, uh, their hand ornaments. And this is a ring from those people. So they have the most advanced knowledge of the solar system. And cosmology, their cosmology is the most complex. And some aspect of it, Western historians, anthropologists, and scientists are studying today. So these are some of the people that we have in this continent yeah. with very in-depth knowledge of um, the solar system. We have definitions of ourselves that says, like in Sisotu, they say, we are Banabalese, the children of light, or children of the stars. Um, some of our storytellers, they speak of three type of people that were in existence from the beginning. That uh, we had the sun people, the people of the sun. We call them Bakalanga, Velanga, Yanobanamaji, Halaka. These are all different names we apply in our different ethnic groups to refer to the people of the sun which is basically the African, what the Greeks say, Ethiopians, the sun yeah, yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. You know, by the sun. That's right. And then you have the people of the sand. That is the Arabs. Yeah. The Geotic. Those are the people of the sand, of the desert. And then you have the people of the ice. You're the peace. That's Europe. The ice men inheritance. Um, there's a book of the Iceman Inheritance which talks a lot about this. Michael uh, Bradley is, it, is the author. Uh, is, it, is the author Michael Bradley? Yes, Michael yeah, Bradley. yeah, yeah. I'm aware of that. Yeah, 
he touches a lot on the subject of the ice man inheritance, the ice concept, why the white man expression is cold. They talk about cold murder, cold case. Yeah. Uh, cold this, cold that. Even the expression is shrunking. It's, it's cold. And then we have this warm expression. In yeah. our languages, in our philosophy, Ubuntu is always a reflection of warm, the sun, the yeah. fire that is in us. That's we right. dance around the fire, we rituals around the fire. We do a whole lot of things around the fire. Uh, and we have stories of the fire in, in our cosmologies and our philosophies and our ontologies yeah. and our um, our our history from uh, our oral tradition, from our, our storytellers. So now it shows that we share different heritage and inheritance. Um, some in the context of the science of common origin or homo origin, they'll talk about that. Well, we were all in Africa and then through a process of migration, some went to Europe and become the Grimaldi men and become the Cromagnon and they become the Neanderthal men, the Basque, the Latin and the current Europeans as we know them, you know, through different framework of migration. Yeah, that uh, the white man was caught in the last ice age, which can be attributed to recessiveness of genes and, and lack of melanin and so forth. And in the is last six, last six thousand years, um, is um, is phenotype and his complexion. Uh, I was speaking to. I had a guy on my show called Robin Walker. And he's explained it's actually 6,000 years that you didn't have no people with actual white skin before this. And, and I thought that was interesting. And what's so interesting, mm. I actually heard yourself speaking on this, which was interesting. Uh, the indo aryan invasion into India it was about 1500 BC. And this was very interesting, this one, because the when we talk about only 6,000 years and then not long after that, it seems that they branched out and conquered a lot of places in ancient times, especially India. And they were part of the Huns in China. You know, they were they all seem a related group, these Indo Europeans. Yeah. Um what basically happened is um about four thousand BC. Yeah. To 3,500 BC, a bunch of barbarians from the Ukrainian steppes <laughs> came down into India and they call themselves Aryans or the noble ones. Yeah. Now, these people, they were traveling with a host which is basically a host of deities. But their chief deity was called Pata, uh, P-A-T-E-R, or P-H-A-T-E-R, Pata. which later which later get to be called Father. Okay. At the root of the word Father. Uh, this was their chief deity, who was very much like a chameleon in character. He adapt to everywhere they reach. This god will adapt to the gods of that place, which is basically what we experience through our colonization and our Christianization. Is that these same Indo-Europeans, these Eurasians, when they come into our into Black Africa? with their Bible and their superior religion. This is the same thing they did in India. Although then they were not introducing Christianity and yeah. they were not introducing Judaism either. But they've always this have this idea of God, the Pata, yeah. which they refer to as God the Father. Now, this concept of God the Father, like in Africa, 
in most of these southern Bantu Africans that I live among, I, I, I speak their language, I've studied their cosmologies, I've studied their spirituality, I've studied their ontologies. They don't have that thing of God the Father. They don't have that. You know, basically for us, God is an energy. He's a great spirit. Now, this great spirit, it send messengers, what they call easy to know God means. So you refer to this great spirit as means, which is basically literally means the maker. And then this great spirit had seven messengers. The first one is Ma, the feminine principle of nourishment and life. That any child who come into this world must come through a woman. Any child who come into this world must have a mother, even if you don't have a father, but you must have a mother. Matriarchal system. Your mother is, but you must know who your mother is because she'll be the one who is doing the nourishing. So, so these Indo Europeans, they, they, they influence Brahmism of the Harappans. Yeah, yeah. Indigenous Indians. Yeah. Um, and and they subscribe to the loss of Manu, which is one of the most racist laws you can come across. I think second to that is the Talmud. Yeah, the very Jews. racist. Yeah. The Jewish Talmud is a, one of the most racist document ever written in the name of God. Mm. So so they had this loss of Manu, which are very, 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 very racist laws. You know? Yeah. So they then fan down into Greek, the Mediterranean, North Africa, come in the form of uh, Hyksos. Uh, okay, can I just pause you a second before you continue? So the Hyksos, would you consider them part of this Indo-European migration, disinvasion? Or were they a mixed multitude, or were they? Did you see different complexions of the Hyksos in Kemet? You see the the light skin Asiatics. Yeah, yeah. Whether of Indo European extraction. Yeah. Or Asian extraction. Yeah. They they come from the same source. Same source. That's okay. Because it's so, funny, though, these groups, uh, even the Huns, the Romans. It's like ethnical differentiation. Yeah. We talk about a different tribe of the same race. Yeah. Um, who manifested in different ways. You know, just like if you talk about the Greeks and Romans, they're just different tribe of the same European race. That's right. Because there was a lot of Africans yeah. in the Mediterranean before... All these mm -hmm. Indo-European before these Indo-European invasions, there's a lot of Africans in Crete, Sicily before all these times. Yes, you see, anywhere you go around the world, you search for the indigenous inhabitants of the place. You're going to find a black person. Definitely, there is a black presence in every one of the continents. The only difference is black people did not go there as colonizers. Yeah. Black people did not go there as slavers. That's right. Black people did not go there as oppressors. Yeah. When these Indo-Europeans came in and come into contact with them, that is why you'll find out about some of the first three popes were black. Yeah. You know, some of the first royalties in Europe were black. Some of the first uh, founders of the Chinese dynasty were black. Uh, now, China is an interesting one as well, because when we were speaking of races before, people speak on the Mongols, the Mon Mongoloids, they call them Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Mongolians. And supposedly there was a large population of black people like about in the last four thousand years during these dynasties. Now I was wondering, where do you think the the Mongol, the Chinese came from? Do you see the Chinese a mixture of Indo-European and Africans, or are they just their own 
separate this Eden? Well, basically, let's go back to Western science. Western science tell us about three group of people. The one I mentioned, but in their different names. Yeah. This there's always been three group of people. In the Bible, they call them the Hamites, the Japhetites, and the Semites. Yeah. And then in Western science or anthropology or, or sociology or whatever they do, they will be referred to that these three group, group of people is called the Negroids, the Caucasoids, which is basically yeah. the Caucasian, and the Mongoloids. Yeah. So the, 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 the Caucasian have their own origin. Yeah. Have their own source. Have their own uh, thing. So basically, the Indo-European, the Aryans, we're talking about the, the Caucasians. They, they are the descendants of the Caucasus mountain. They are the same family with the Khazars and the Ashkenazi. Oh, yeah. Um, found where well, they were mainly coming from the Ukrainian steppes. Yeah. That is the, the, their, or, their home, the, or their original home. Yeah. And then, of course, you have the Mongoloids, the, the, the Chinese, yeah. the Japanese, the people of Thailand, all of that. They they are collectively, in terms of their historical origin, they are collectively classified as Mongoloids. And then, and then you have the Dhaka people now. They are collectively referred to as the Negroids, which they will talk about two types of Ethiopians. The woolen hair Ethiopians and the straight hair Ethiopians. Yeah. Um, that is when um the Indian Ocean was still called the Ethiopian Ocean. Yeah, that's right. That is uh, in those days. Yeah. When Ethiopia a rulership extended to India. That's right. Um those Dalits of it of India, those black people of India, Dravidians those and, um, yeah. Dravidians. Yeah. Abbas people. Those are our people. That's right. Those Afro-headed Indians. Well, I hear this. There was um, one of um, a good anthropologist, Clyde Winters, if you never check him out. He speaks on a group of people. You know the Sahara Desert? Before that was a desert when it was green, lush. He mentions about um, a population going into Sumer. What? There's a, uh, when the Sahara Desert... Before it became a desert, the Sahara. You know the Sahara Desert. So before, yeah, it 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 was a lake before it was a desert. Yeah, before, yeah, yeah, before there was a desert. Yeah, so he was explaining there was a group of Africans that migrated to India, migrated to Sumer, and also Sudan. So he was he was relating these to a Niger Congo people. So that's obviously a Bantu people, isn't it? Connected. He was, he was saying they spoke a man, the Mandi language. Um, Clyde Winters, he was explaining that they went into India and become Dravidians, went into Sumer, and also Persia become the Elamites. You see, the idea that um, black people establish the first Chinese dynasty, black people rule all the way from Ethiopia to India by the river Ganges. Yeah. That the, river, that the sacred river of India, Ganges, is named after the Ethiopian emperor called Ganges. Yeah. This does not take away the fact that there were Indians when black people were in India. Yeah. Just like black people who went to Spain and established and ruled Spain for 700 years Most. and established... Mm the first university of Salamanca. Yeah. And, and not only establish that, but establish certain protocols about life, hygiene, 
uh, taught Europeans how to take a bath and all of that. Yep. So, so, so they were Europeans, but these black people, they're the one who introduced civilization. Remember, we had four golden ages, we as the African, while the rest of these people had only one golden age. Yeah. We had four golden ages. We, at one time, we were on top of the world. At one time, we were a superpower, like how America is. We influenced civilization. At one time, uh, we were a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. We, up until the days of the Pharaonic Egypt, um, uh, the, 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 even post the, pil- the pyramid building period, we were a superpower. And our superpower status was challenged from 1675 BC. Yeah, but before that, if you are going to read sacred science by Lubricks, um, his his recording ancient dynasties of Kemet that goes way back to thirty thousand years ago. Well, wow. even Maneto, the last Egyptian priest, even Maneto make that recording make mention of dynasties of the ancient pharaohs who were black pharaohs from Nubia, like, like the black Sudanese, which date back to 80,000 years ago. Right. So, but any other Western scholarship you come across, they tell you about Kemet, either it started 6,000 years ago because the white man likes to bring everything to his 6,000 years of existence. Yes. When I was, when I was right. studying in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in Ethiopia, I got a, a scholarship uh, given by the late uh, head of the Orthodox Church, the late Abuna, um, who was the head of the church. He came to South Africa, yet they were coming to open the church. I was the only Rastafari in the, in, on, on manning that guard of honor. But I went there because of curiosity. It was for the first time I see a church with so much rainbow colors, more than the Rastafari. In Ethiopia, like, wow. No, no, in Johannesburg. They were opening the Ethiopia. Oh, oh in Johannesburg, sorry, sorry, yeah. Yeah, in the, around the year 2000, they were opening a church at Beria called Siration uh, Medani Alep. So... It was so well draped in rainbow, it was well decorated. So it caught my attention when I was passing. I wondered what was going on. I found that they are welcoming this pontiff of Ethiopia, the Buddha. So I joined the crew because of curiosity. But when he passed, he saw me. I had my Haile Selassie pendant here. Yeah. I had my Haile Selassie. Place. He saw me and then he hauled it. He said, Why don't you join the African? He said to me, Sorry, why don't you join the African church? I asked him, Which one is the African church? He said, The Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Uh-huh. I said, Which church am I part of which is not African? He said, The Rastafarians. They are Jamaicans. I said to him, Jamaicans are Africans. Right. Stolen from Africa through the transatlantic slave trade. He said, okay, but if you find yourself a way to Ethiopia, I'll give you a scholarship to study with the Orthodox Church. And a year later, I found my way into Ethiopia. And uh, four weeks later, it took me four weeks to reach Ethiopia. Uh, I was traveling with buses from South Africa to Zambia, Zambia, Tanzania, Tanzania, Kenya, Kenya, Ethiopia. But I had to stay in Ethiopia, in Kenya for seven days waiting for visa. They're applying it uh, in South Africa through the embassy. And then I had to spend another week with an old man who used herbs and fruits to kill in, in Tanzania. <laughs> So he looked at me and saw my little bit of belly. He was like, you are so unhealthy. Uh, you need a program. Must come here and enlist in my program. 
clinic in program. So he kind of detained me for a week, a week or two. I stayed with him. Very pleasant person to stay with, very knowledgeable. I learned a lot. Um, all in all, my movement from South Africa to Italy took me four weeks. So, so I had people who volunteered uh, to to show their kindness towards me, uh, and also to travel with me and show me some other historical places. So that is why I know some of the things that I know about um, these issues, you know, all these situations, um, infiltration. Think- yeah, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> speaking of like Ethiopia and the Orthodox Church, how do you view the Orthodox? I mean, like I know it's the original of the well, you know, Western Christianity is totally demolished now. Orthodox, the story of Solomon. What do you do? You, do you take any of that story serious, or is it just mythological story of Solomon? Well, you see, what is interesting, as I observed, I studied, I stayed in Ethiopia for two years. Yeah. I got a four-year scholarship, but I cannot, I, I only managed to do two years. Yeah. I had to drop, come back home, take care of some of the responsibilities. My life is in such a way that I can't afford to just go and spend four years somewhere. Yes. Yeah. So, one, one, First thing I observe, the Ethiopians don't share the same illusions that those of us who are Ethiopianese, Rastafari, or who are fond of using Ethiopia as our frame of reference do. Okay. Ethiopians are very honest with their history. They'll tell you that the founder of their church, Framinatos or Frumentius, who later became Abba Salam, was a Greek. The first bishop of the Orthodox Church was a Greek. They tell you that the founders of monasticism was the nine saints from Syria. Syria. They'll tell you that of all the saints of the Ethiopian church, there's only one saint with his, who is African and who is Ethiopian, and that is Abuna Tegla Haimanot. Okay. All of these saints of the church, they are either Coptic Arabs, you know, European Greeks, you know, and the one Roman woman, Saint Helena, the mother of Constantine. You yeah. see, they're very clear, they're very honest about their history. Mm. That they are a, a mixture that is influenced by. Eh? Yes, yeah, it's funny you say that as a mixture because I always wondered, like, who are the original Ethiopians? Who are the indigenous ones? Is it the Oromo? Are they the first Ethiopians or some of the ones who came from Arabia? Turkey or whatever they came from, Italy, some of them. You see, there is a lot of, you know, the nature of civilization. Civilization is a crossbreeding of cultures. Yeah. There's a lot of crossbreeding that took place between the Africans of Ethiopia and the Europeans and the Africans of other parts of Africa and produce the populations that we have, you know. So, um, there being a mixing and mixture, a mixing up that has been going on around. Yeah. A mixing up of people, of ideas, of cultures, of civilization. Right, okay. Yeah. You know, so, most of these things, um, when you look at them, it's things that we hold them in common, you know, all over the world. We just call them in different names, particularly the black communities of the world. Yeah. They're very different, but we call them with different names. It's like in right. Somalia. In, in Somalia, you have, in South Somalia, you got a Bantu people. I've seen a lot of Bantu peoples in South Somalia, whereas the North, um, that's the majority of the other Somalians, for example. Well, original Somalia was inhabited by the Bantu people. Yeah. A group of Bantu people. That's it. And uh, today you 
they are the, one of the threatened or endangered species in Somalia. Definitely, Somalia. yeah. So, Definitely. Terrible, yeah. terrible. Yeah. Through persecution and so forth. Definitely That's like right. the original inhabitants of Ethiopia were Bantu, you know, the Sidamas. Yeah. And the Oro. These mm. are Bantu groups. Yeah. You know, but after being dominated for many years, the, 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 the Stockholm syndrome get hold of them. That's they started right. to identify with their subjugators. That's always the and way. That's because the oppressor always comes claiming a superior culture. Whether that oppressor is European or is African, as in the case of Ethiopia and its neighbors. Yeah. As in yeah. the case of Nyabingi and its practitioners. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got a little bit more than one minute to go. If I could fire off one last question, and I definitely would like you to get you back on again also. But um, I can see we've got a minute left. I'm interested to know. It's not for me to know. It's for the, the, the listener to know. The word God. Now, now when we see God as in a spirit, now within this spirit, is this the negative and positive energy? When we say God, is it it has to be made up of negative and positive energy, is it? You're talking about God. Yeah. As a spirit. Yeah. Energy or spirit. Yeah. Yeah. That is it a positive or a negative energy? Or is it both? Well, um, I had a conversation with my um, Indian brother, friend, who is a, 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 a convert of Islam. And he, he tried to convert me to Islam. Okay. You know, you have those friends who think you are incomplete until they create you in their own image and likeness. Yeah. You know, so he tried to preach a thing for me from the Quran and the Hadiths and some Islamic tradition. The question was before what is God in Africa? Now, when we say spirit or energy, are we referring to like a negative, a positive, almost like a yin and yang, that kind of thing, opposite, laws of opposites? Is that what we're dealing with when we say God in Africa compared to what the Bible or the Quran says? What um what we refer to God is a great spirit. The great spirit. The great spirit. Moya the great spirit. Now, the great spirit is an androgynous force. It's a force that is androgynous. It carries with it male and female qualities within it. Um, this androgynous force we call God. Among the, Bas uh, the Botswana people, they call it Mudimu, which is basically um, a, a noun of the third category of the Bantu noun. Which is what we call the category of mo me. Mo, these are the words that begin with mo and m and me, which is m e. So like mollo, which is fire, musi, which is smoke, mokodi, which is rainbow, muani, which is mist, mezi, which is water. Now, all of these are natural forces. So God is categorized within the category of natural forces. Natural forces that has no pl plurality. Uh, we don't have the water and waters. We don't have the plurality of water. We don't have the plurality of a mist. We don't have a plurality of smoke. <coughs> we don't have a plurality of fire. <coughs> and all of these are natural forces. So what we call Mudimu is nature, what we call God is nature deified, the deified nature. And, and this deified nature, there's no plurality. As I was giving an example that uh, I had a conversation with my Indian friend or brother 
who is a Muslim who tried to convert me to Islam. And then in our conversation, I said to him that, what do you call Holy Spirit right now um, in the church? It is called oxygen in laboratory. Now, think of it as oxygen. Do you think oxygen have issues with me for not worshipping it? Do you think oxygen is out there worried about me committing sin? No. Do you think oxygen is out there worried about me not giving reverence to it? Of course it doesn't. So this is our understanding of God. It's like an oxygen that gives itself freely to everyone. It's like the sun that shines for everybody. It's like the rain that falls to everyone. God belongs to no religion. Um, God belongs to no particular religious denomination. And, and, and God cannot be contained in a book. And our African concept of God is that God who is everywhere, not somewhere. We don't have a place called heaven, which is the abode of God, and a place called earth, which is the abode of man, and a place called the hell, which is the abode of the devil and his demons. We don't have that. Actually, in African cosmology and in African spirituality, we don't have Satan. We don't have uh, a, a, the opposite of God. We don't have a force that is in opposition with God. Actually, our oldest symbol of God is a circle with a dot. That everything within that circle is God. Now, everything within this circle, this ball we call Earth, is God. The sun, the moon, the stars, the tree. That's why Europeans, when they come here, they ask some of our ancestors, what do you think is God? They say God is in a tree, God is in a stone, God is in everything. They say you people are animist. You see? Yeah. Uh, some, they try to question. Because you see, Europeans, what they did, they used comparative studies in order to study us. Whether it's comparative linguistic dynamics, they compare what they have in their language with what we have. So they use uh, equivalent, not direct translation, what is equivalent to in their language. So if you study... Uh, I have a, a large collection of books written by missionaries. Uh, and that point of encounter, the first encounter of the missionary and the indigenous people, although the missionaries are writing from a biased point of view, from a prejudiced point of view, from their racism point of view, from their agenda as missionaries, which was the spiritual arm of colonization. Uh, religion, Christianity. But what is interesting you always pick up is the conversation between the missionaries and our ancestors. So one of the missionaries who was charged with responsibility to convert the Basotho king called Mushwesho, the missionary, his name is Eugene Casal Casalis. He was from, um, I think he was from, from Paris Mission Missionary Society. Eugene Casalis said the first time he met a Basutu elder, he wanted to ascertain what is the Basutu concept of God. First, he assumed that in our concept of God is that the God is the creator. So most of them, they will ask, according to you and your people, who created this? The heavens and the earth, the firmament and the earth, who created the sun, the moon, and the stars? So now, when he had this conversation with this Basutu elder, and this elder said to him, we as the Basutu people, we don't preoccupy ourselves with such stupid questions like who made the earth? Because such a question, it will require an eyewitness for you to answer it for real, in its true sense. For you to tell me that this earth was created by God, you should have seen God creating it. Yes. Now, now, the Western civilization has given us two theories of existence which is called evolution and creation. Now, creationism is a religious theory, and evolution is a scientific theory, Western scientific, Western science theory. Yeah. So, uh, stuff developed by the likes of Darwin, uh, mm -hmm. Russell, Wallace, 
all these guys. Big Bang Theory, all that one. Yeah. yeah. So now the Western system gave us two theories of existence, evolution and creation. And these two systems of existence, or these two theories of existence, all of them, they place men in the end of the whole process. Um, creation said God created things from Sunday until the Friday. Hmm. And then the last thing he created on Friday was men. So man is the end product of the whole creation story. So man was not there on Thursday when God created things that he created on Thursday. Man was not there on Wednesday when God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Man was not there on Tuesday when God created all trees that need to be cut by an X, all plants that can be plucked by hand, and all plants that can be plucked by a sickle. Man was not there when God divided the waters of the sea, the ocean, and the rivers on Monday. So man was not there when God created all these eight things, including the seven heavens, the angels, and all of these things. So what men say that God on Sunday created this and this, and man is talking theory. Man is talking things he did not see. Um, that is in, in creation theory. Now, when you go to evolution theory, they tell you that... Uh, about X amount of billion years, and then there was this explosion, they call it the Big Bang, and then it produces the super, at last, that's the super clusters, they produce the galaxies, the galaxies, all of that, the planet and everything until our Earth, and then in the last 30 seconds of this process, then a man emerged. The last 30 seconds, you know, of the final process, after all these billions of years of evolution, the last 30 seconds of that process came man. Now, after man, nothing else evolved. Man is the last thing that evolved within the framework of evolution. So again, within the framework of evolution, man is not the eyewitness of the things he talks about that they evolved before him. This is the part where I always ask a question, is the Bible the word of God or the word about God? Yeah. Of course, the Bible is about God. It's not the word of God. Man said, God said. When we read Genesis, they said the first book of Moses called Genesis. And then the first line, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's a narrative. It's a man narrating a story. And was, if it was the book of God, it was going to say, in the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. It would be God telling his story. So it's man telling us what God said. But yeah. unfortunately, this man is called Moses. He was not born in the whole book of Genesis. He's actually get to be born in the second book called Exodus. So this guy talked about what was before his birth. And he went on and talked about his death and even after his death. He tell you that and Moses did not reach the promised land and Moses died and no one knows where is the grave of Moses. That is in the book of Deuteronomy. That is Moses now again talking, telling you about what happened to Moses. He died. And nobody knows where he's buried. But he's still narrating the story, but he's dead. Yeah. Just like he narrated the story of creation, but he wasn't there. That's right. Until the second book. So yeah. these are all stories that has no eyewitness. <laughs> so the Basutu elder said to Eugene Casalis, uh, 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 this French missionary, that uh, um, for us, the Basutu people, we don't preoccupy ourselves with questions like that, that has no eyewitness. Now tell me if that is not being a scientist. Yeah. You know, now we practice African cosmological science. Our science still demand what science demands, evidence. You know, for you to say it is, it is a scientific knowledge. It must have an evidence. It must be tested. It must be proven. And he's saying to this white man that uh, that which is not tested and proven does not enter into what is called our collective knowledge. We don't hold on to things that we don't we do we, we can't provide evidence for. So so the white man tried to. One, to assume that the Africans, when they talk of God, they talk of a creator. 
Yeah. You know, talk about our stories of existence or our stories of origin, most of them, they don't even talk of a creator or creation. We talk of emanation. We talk of existence. We existed. We were not created. Now, you, if I can... You, you if I can tell us who created us. If I can... Like, if, if I could ask you a question surrounding this, because this is a very interesting topic now, where we came from, okay. from our or, oral history, where did we come from? I mean, did we come from, are we from Earth, or would we spirits, energy forces that were in other dimensions, or did we come from, I mean, the physical and the spiritual, basically. Were we in the spiritual we be higher dimensions like I mean I'm trying to put it like have, have we always been here on this planet or did we come from somewhere we've always been in this planet we don't come from anywhere else okay we are we are earth spirits like I show you that in most of our cosmologies we are inner terrestrial we come from within the earth whether okay. we came through a bed of reeds, whether we came out of the waters of Nu, the primordial waters, okay. whether we came from one of the large cavens here in South Africa, in Bumalanga, in the Eastern Transvaal, when you go in towards Mozambique, we have 75,000 years old Bantu temples, wow. which are in a form of caves. Okay. And cavern where you go under the earth, where you see an underground life. Wow. Where you get placed on the window. On the ground and life. Then, yes. And then in the same province of Mbumalang, yeah, we got an old, the oldest uh, calendar, a uh, stone calendar. They, the white men, they discovered it in 2003. One white man was flying with this uh, small aircraft and then it fell. And then he, he fell around that. That's how the white man discovered that. It's just a later discovery. Discovered, discovered in 2003. And then the white man, they call it Adam's calendar. Uh, as, as you know that the white men, they would like to biblicize knowledge. That's right. When when they discovered the, the woman who is the mother of all females on earth, who existed in Central Africa 300,000 years ago, when they wrote about the hair in the Time magazine of 1994, they wrote the African Eve. And so they use Eve, Adam and Eve as prototypes because those are their ancestors. But they are referring to our ancestors who are way older than Adam and Eve because this particular woman, she's she is um, 294,000 years older than Eve. Okay. Right. Yet you still refer to her as the African Eve. So okay. you're using Eve as the prototype. So you're using the Bible as the final judge of all African things. African knowledge, African cosmology, uh, African origin. You're using the Bible and you start to approximate what we have with what you have, that, okay, this because he's the oldest man, you're going to call him the African Adam. We see this thing that have the African this or the black God. Once they say black God, you must know that the black God is a poor imitation of the white God. Once they say the African Adam, you must know that that African Adam is a poor imitation of the non-African Adam or the European Adam. Uh, once they say the African Eve, you must know that they're talking about a poor imitation of their original Eve. So they're making you a carbon copy of them, even though that your what is said about you, it predated them with 300,000 years, like in this case of this woman who's the mother of all. I studied theology with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. In the, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, they say Adam was created in 4004 BC on the 26th of October, 4004 BC, which makes Adam 6,000 years old. All theology, Catholic, Orthodox, 
Protestant, all theologists agree that Adam is 6,000 years old. Right, all Orthodox, history of so. Orthodox, even the Orthodox agree as well. Well, Orthodox agree as well. Hmm? See, I thought that was only a Western thing, but Orthodox also agree about the 6,000 yeah. before. Oh, my gosh. That's ridiculous. It is. Yes, these are Greek things. These are, these are European. I mean, when you talk about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the foundation of, of it is a Greek church. And it followed everything Greek until... Uh, the day in 1947 when Haile Selassie gave that church autonomy. But they were so happy to follow in that. They look at the paintings of the church, the saints, all of that. You know, some of them are black skin with European hair. Yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> I wondered why. Yeah, they never had a problem with that. You know, yeah. it is only us now who are practicing. Pan Africanist, black conscious, or black supremacy, yeah. or or consciousness that is tied up with African nationalism, yeah. or Africanity. Now we try to use Ethiopia as a model. Now you're using people who don't have the same problem you have with you. Naturally, so because they say they were never colonized, so yes. they don't they don't don't have to deal with a whole lot of the Rastafari is a response to colonialism and slavery. Ethiopia was never colonized. How is it that Rastafari can use Ethiopia as its point of reference when it doesn't share the same experience? Rastafari should use Sub-Sahara Africa that was colonized, enslaved, like the Rastafari of the Caribbean islands of Jamaica, uh, America, England, uh, wherever the Black people are found. Because now, these for... are the same people who share the same experience. Mm. We were all colonized by the same devil, yeah. We were all enslaved by the same devil. So using Rastafari, it is prudent for Rastafari to use Africa as its point of reference. Yeah. And to use the than to use the fantasy of the problem with Rastafari is is like it wants to claim greater anciency, greater history, greater this. Yeah. In order to validate when it's supposed to be validating itself based on its experience. Because as far as a liberty, it's a lived experience, not a learned behavior. It's not a, a, a lectural discourse. It's not a classroom thing. So it's a lived experience of the dread. Now, this lived experience of the dread, it is based on what we have gone through. We have certain similarities, you know, Rastafari in Jamaica went through a lot of persecution, Rastafari in South Africa went through a lot of persecution during apartheid. The whites, the Boers, they used to compare these same Rastafari colors with the ANC colors and other liberation movement colors. So we were branded the same, we were beaten the same way, we were persecuted and prosecuted the same way. So Rastafari was not having any form of exemption. Now with Ethiopia, e Ethiopia, funny enough, because a lot of people say this is the place that's never been colonized. You know, now it when we say never been colonized, it must add no, some influence. If you could no, explain, it was the place to be colonized in Africa through religion. It's been colonized it's through been... religion. Now, how did yeah. it get? How did it get colonized through religion? How did that happen? No, I mean, like if you. The very same history that most people are using it to pride themselves with and say Ethiopia was never colonized is about yeah. the history of colonization because it's about the story of the Queen of Sheba and Solomon. Yeah. The first colon Queen of Sheba. Yeah. Solomon, who was an, an Asiatic man. Yeah. Um, in the, when you study the Cabranegas, the conversation between King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba in their conversation. They, they talk about the religion of Ethiopia. And then the Queen of Sheba said to Solomon, in my country, I worship the moon. Uh, 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 some people worship, I worship the sun. Some people worship the moon, others worship the stars. Yes. She's basically declaring to Solomon the freedom of religion that exists in Ethiopia, that people worship God as they see fit. Yeah. This is what they say in the heart. I say that, Let every man worship God as they see fit for them to do. Now, 
six months down the line after she spent all this time with Solomon, uh, after she slept with Solomon, impregnated by Solomon's child, uh, uh, pregnant with Solomon's child, when she returned back to Ethiopia, she then reached there and gave out a royal decree and say, from now on, everyone shall worship the God of Israel. Now tell me if it is not colonization. Yeah. I visit England. I sit with you for three months. I came back. I say uh, to the people of South Africa, from now on, we're going to do things the English way. Tell me yeah. if that is not colonization. Oh, definitely. Definitely colonization. So that was the first time when Ethiopia colonized itself through religion. That was this come of... Was this coming from, you know, with Alexandria? Are we talking at the time yeah. of Alexandria when he he decolonized Egypt, and is it slow, the Coptic? Is it started with the Coptic, the Orthodox? Before the Orthodox, was it the Coptic, the Christianity? Now, now that is the second part because what we are talking about, we are talking about a period about nine hundred to a thousand years before Christianity. Okay. Before the Coptics and all of that. Okay. That is the second lake of Ethiopian colonization. The first lake, it is during the Judaic period, during okay. Judaism. Okay. Because during Solomon and Sheba, there was no Christianity, there was no New Testament. Yeah. Then you have the second colonization, which is recorded in the Bible, that an Ethiopian Luke, he met Philip. He's studying this book, he doesn't understand it which is foreign to him, another evidence that the Bible was never Ethiopian. Even the Ethiopian, when the first Ethiopian who is mentioned to be reading the book of Isaiah, he could not understand it. It was not written in his language or written in the way that he can comprehend. So it had to took Philip, the apostles, to read for him, according to the Acts of the Apostles, Acts 8, Acts chapter 8, that it required a Philip, the apostle, to read it for him and give him his translation of it. And then he took what Philip taught him and got baptized by Philip and go into Ethiopia. They like to mention that, that this Ethiopian Enoch, John Dereba, who was reading the book of Isaiah, the treasury of the Kandaki, the queen of Ethiopia, could get converted and baptized and he become the first Christian. So, he met Christianity outside of Ethiopia in Jerusalem. He met Christianity not as a religion of Ethiopia or an indigenous religion of Ethiopia, but a foreign religion that he could not even understand its scripts, its scriptures. He had to have somebody to translate them, uh, 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 proselytize him into this belief system and baptize him and take him through the rituals of baptism. Then he came back to Ethiopia. So everything about that situation is foreign. You understand? Everything is foreign. It wasn't his original religion. He needed somebody to translate it for him. That is one part. But the official part is that there were two um, uh, uh, Greeks who were traveling with their teacher uh, 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 around the coast of Djibouti, Ethiopia, there, then they get a shipwreck, and uh, then they found their way into the court of King Azana, actually, uh, yeah, the court of King Azana, and then, uh, then they later converted the king, uh, and so forth, and, 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 and that Greek became the first bishop of Ethiopia, whom the Ethiopians, they gave, nicknamed him Abba Salam. But his name is Fermentius, which in G is, they say, Framinatus, which is basically the Ethiopian version of a Greek name. You know, they have a lot of that, like Jesus Christos. Yeah. It's the Ethiopic version of a Greek name, Jesus or Jesus. Okay. So some, some Rasta, some Ethiopianist or, or, or Black people who subscribe to the Orthodox Church as if it's an African church, They'll be saying, no, it's not Jesus, it's Jesus Christos. But that is an Ethiopic version of a Greek name. You know, here, our, our version of Jesus' name, we call him Jesu or Jesu, J-E-S-O. But it is the 
it is the Africanization of a non-African name, whether among the Bantu or among the Ethiopians, be it the Amharas or, or the Tigrians or Sidamas and so forth. So the first bishop of Ethiopia was not Ethiopian, who then went to the Coptics of Egypt, which is the Arabs and the Europeans were there running the Coptic church and tell them that Ethiopia needs to have a bishop and they consecrate him as the first bishop who was Greek. Now you have a Greek as the first bishop of the Ethiopian church. Wow. It was the Orthodox church, the Greek church. The Ethiopian Orthodox church is a Greek church. And, and, and you must remember that the New Testament, which the Christian churches base itself on, was written in Koine Greek. Uh, the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So, now His Majesty also talk about this thing. He said, Ethiopia received first the religion of the Old Testament. And it was the first to receive the religion of the New Testament. Now, when he say receive, received from who? From outsiders. In the case of Old Testament, they receive it from Solomon. In the case of the New Testament, they receive it from Philip, the apostle, who was not an Ethiopian. And then they took it, and then they embraced it, and they Ethiopianized it. But it, nevertheless, it remained non-Ethiopian religion. So the Ethiopians, they will tell you that the founders of most monastic, monastic order in Ethiopia, monasticism, are the nine saints from Syria. They'll tell you that one of their saints Government first caduce is from the Coptic Egypt. Actually, they will tell you that the only Ethiopian, the only saint in all the 200, the 200 saints they have, the only saint who's indigenous and who's Ethiopian is Tekla Haimanot. It's only one. Out of the 200 saints they have, only one is Ethiopian. And he came after so many saints. He came after the nine saints who established the monastic order in Ethiopia. He came after the, the, the bishop uh, Frumentius, he came after uh, all of these people who laid the foundation of the Orthodox Church, so, as we know it today. Yeah, so what now, about, uh, sorry, um, see, you got other religions as well. So, see, Islam, when Islam came, with, what did that come out of? Did that come out of Christianity, the fall of Christianity, then a new religion rise uh, with Islam, you know? Their connection. You see, Islam is based on Jewish and Christian mythology. Okay. Uh, and, and collectively, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam collectively are called Abrahamic religion. Yeah. Um, as opposed to African religion. They're not African, they're Abrahamic. Now, Islam uh, is the Arab and Muhammad's interpretation of the Bible. Okay. Both the New and the Old Testament. Yeah. And, and, and they absorb a whole lot of Jewish and Christian mythologies. And they went into their holy book and their holy traditions like the Hadiths and all of these things. Okay. But Islam, I, I, I always say that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam should be cons should be perceived by the African consciousness the same way Nazism is perceived by the Jewish consciousness. Yeah, these are murderous cults that infected our people, colonized our people, murdered a lot of our people. Yeah. So Islam did a lot of terrible job in Africa. It disseminated the whole of North Africa that today. You you hardly can see a black person in Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Algeria, yeah. Tunisia. Understand these areas that they, today they refer to them as a Maghreb region. Yeah. It was this general, Islam, uh, Arabian general, who invaded, I keep on forgetting his name, is... Um, uh, Ibn Ibrahim who Aben, I'll remember his name. But this general who arrived in Egypt in 
uh, on the 12th of December, uh, 639 AD. Yeah. He wiped out Egypt. He went on to wipe out some part of Libya, you know, wipe some part of uh, North Africa and lay the foundation for the... Within 100 years of the rise of Islam, the whole of Africa, the whole of North Africa was disseminated. Yeah. The armies of Islam in uh, invading North Africa contributed to the great Bantu migration. Because the Bantu people who stayed in those places, they started to migrate southward. They started to leave North Africa, come back through following the Nile River, others uh, coming through the, the Sahel, uh, others passing, coming through the Sahara Desert, um, coming through Chad, uh, Lake Chad, and, and so forth, and coming down, down, down. And one of the cause of their push coming down was uh, the, 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 the Islamic armies in North Africa. Now you get a lot of black people tell you that Islam is African, it's not. Uh, the fact that the first Muslim of Islam was an Ethiopian, um, uh, oh, Bilal. Bilal, yeah. yeah. Uh, Bilal al Sudan was African because he was a slave of Muhammad. You know, who yeah. used him, who used him and overused him, even at the age of 83, he was still called to come and call the faithful to prayer. And he got there and shout, Allah Akbar, because this man had this sweet voice that they had to use him, even when he was an old man, to call the faithful to prayer. So Islam is not black. Nothing about it is black. And Nation of Islam in America and these other black Muslims and the Biofall in <laughs> West Africa and Senegal, they're just doing what black Christians are doing. You know, They are desperately trying to Africanize something that is not African for their own convenience. Yeah. Well, of course. Well, you know, I, I will... It's all about Pan-Africanism, and that's the only way we're going to connect globally. You know, there's many of us around the world where we have internet now. There's no excuse for us to, you know, it's like I've reached out to yourself because I've watched some of your videos. I thought they were amazing. African spirituality, speaking about the Bantu migrations, speaking about what is God, you know, the the you know, it's been really excellent. And this is how we've got to connect. I interviewed some people in South Africa and Namibia. And I travel. I've met a lot of the indigenous black people in Asia as well. I've been into the Philippines. I'm about to go into rainforest, seven-hour drives in Thailand. There's 300 black people left in Thailand called the Mani. There's the Eta people in the Philippines I met. Um, there's about a couple of thousand of them left in Orange Asli tribe in Malaysia. That I met, there's a couple of thousand of them, and they're slowly dying out. And I like to always speak to people, like I like to go speak to the people. That's how I get my information. We can learn something from scientists, and we can learn something from creationists, in to a degree. But it's about our own history and the ancestors. Now, one question I've got to ask just before we go: we got three minutes left. The ancestors. Now. The ancestors, when they pass away, what what is the what would you say? Where do they go, and can can we we can still communicate with them when they pass? Well, um, there is an African saying that says, "The dead are not dead. The dead are in the wind. If you want to speak to the dead, speak to the wind." That the dead are dying of thirst, you must always pour libation to the dead uh, for some water. Now, the, the ancestors, they are not alive, they are not dead, they exist. This is where we have this uh, thing, that we have life and existence. We are alive, we are the living, but the ancestors, they exist. So, there's the realm of existence. Now, we say 
um, in our Bantu traditions of Southern Africa here, yeah, we talk about the grave as what is coming in between us, the living and 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 those who are beyond the grave, or what they call the living dead. That uh, when you're dead, you kind of like have taken off the 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 the, the, the garments of flesh, which is called sedopo, this thing. When you are dead, the dead body is set up. So you are now, so we have this thing that everyone who died, they go to Batimu or the place of gods or the divine place, the abode, the netherworld on the other side of the grave. So um, the rituals of the dead that we perform are actually the rituals that are necessary to make you a good ancestor or so forth. Now, this, the ancestors, they differ. We have what they call Amadlozi and Amatongo. You know, now Amadlozi is the one that will possess you even to drive you to initiate into traditional healing if they themselves were traditional healers and they your calling is to be a traditional healer, a sango. And then you have Amatongo. These are the gods of the dreams, uh, or the gods of the stars. Those who visit to, to you, uh, you through dreams, uh, and manifesting through dreams. So we have a good word for sleeping, which is Ogutonga, or to be one with the star gods, or to be one with the gods of the stars. And then when you dream, they say Ogupupa, which means to fly. So basically, to sleep and to dream, it is. To, to fly and become one with the gods of the stars.